But once again, good morning. morning. He is risen. risen What a good promise. Jesus is risen. Last week, this week, next week. He is risen for you, and he's risen for me, and he's risen for your neighbor who seems to always drive you nuts. He is risen, and that is good for you and me. There's something about our nature, though, that is not very satisfied with just hearing a good story and calling it good enough. Like, you guys know this, right? When there's an accident on one side of the interstate, what do you do on the other side of the interstate? You slow down and rubberneck because you want to see everything that happened for yourself. And then you cause an accident on that side of the interstate, and then nobody's going anywhere. You know this if you have brothers or sisters, but especially brothers, like, they find gross things, and they're not content to just tell you about the gross thing. They have to show you. Or be like, hey, check out how spoiled this milk is. Smell this. Right? There's something in our nature that wants more than just a good story we've heard. We want something to be real and real for us. And you and I live 2,000 years removed from the death and resurrection of Jesus. And unfortunately, in many times and in many places, we are inundated with this message. He is risen. just trying to see if you fell asleep yet. We're inundated with this message and we know the story. Of course he's risen. Yeah, I've heard all about that since I was a little kid. And of course Jesus loves me. Don't you know that song they've always sung? And unfortunately for us, in many cases, this really, really good news, earth-shattering, world-changing news that he is risen for us often becomes... Just another thing we know, but it doesn't seem all that real. And it can be easy to be distracted 2,000 years removed and say, okay, he's risen, but cancer seems to still be present. Why? We can say he is risen, but my loved ones have died, and I'm still sad. He is risen, and yet my addiction won't break. So what's the point of following him if things don't change? What's the point in hoping that he is risen if my life doesn't seem any different? Over the course of the next several weeks, we're going to be asking that question, what's the point? And I know there's a little play on words there, because we're the point, like who are we as a church? But more importantly, if Jesus is truly risen, What's the point in everything we do? How do we go about our daily lives differently because he's risen? For some people, because he is risen means now life should be easy, right? He is risen, there shouldn't be any more problems. Has that been your experience? He is risen, and because he's risen, I should now be able to have all the answers to all my questions. And yet you find yourself wrestling, saying, some things still don't make sense. And I don't always get an answer when I'm asking God, and sometimes the answer I get feels like the opposite of what I was hoping for. What's the point if I don't know what to do next? Today, eight days after Easter Sunday, according to the way Jews would count the calendar, because any portion of a day counted as a whole day. So even though it's only seven days later, one week later, it'd be be eight for them. Today, eight days after he's risen, as we dive into scripture, we're going to see a man who gets a really bad rap most of the time. Have you ever heard of a man named Thomas? Okay, some of you have. For the rest of you, let me tell you, he was one of the disciples He walked with Jesus for three years. He experienced miracle after miracle. He got to listen to Jesus' preaching firsthand, which would be way better than you guys having to listen to me. We don't get to have that. He got to be there when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. And he got to be there that week as Jesus suffered 
and died, going, now what? And eight days after the resurrection, Thomas is left out. You see, all the other disciples at this point have experienced Jesus risen from the dead. They've seen it with their own eyes firsthand. And they've told Thomas, he's risen. And Thomas says, I don't believe it. Because let's be honest, have you ever seen somebody rise from the dead? I haven't, and honestly, if I do, it will freak me out. I don't know that I want that at the next funeral I I do, even though I kind of do. All the other disciples experience that first Easter day where Jesus shows up and proves to them that he's risen, but not Thomas. Thomas, he hears a good story, but it's not yet real for him. And so he's kind of been given this bad rap throughout history where it's like, oh, doubting Thomas over here, he just doesn't quite believe. We shouldn't be like Thomas. We should just fully believe. And sometimes we think that doubt, therefore, is the problem. And if you doubt your faith, or if some of these promises of God seem too good to be true, then maybe there's something wrong with you. Thomas, here in the story, he's desperate to see it real for himself. If you want, you can join me in John chapter 20. The same chapter where Jesus rises from the dead and he appears to Mary Magdalene, who herself did not recognize that it was Jesus. And then Jesus appears to the disciples who themselves don't recognize that it's Jesus. Why is it that Thomas gets such a bad rap? It seems nobody really gets it until God makes it clear. Here's how the story goes. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. It's easy to villainize Thomas. How can you not believe Jesus said it would happen? And yet, this story seems so far from possible. Unless I see it with my own eyes, I can't believe it. In many ways, we're not that much different from Thomas today. Filled with doubts, we live in a culture that says reason and rational thought is the most important thing. Now, that doesn't mean we're all very good at reasoning or thinking rationally, but we've elevated our ability to comprehend and to observe and to analyze as the primary thing to know what is true and what is not. We're not much different than Thomas. Thomas, he hears this really good story of something too good to be true, and he says, I just can't believe it myself. But aren't we often quite like that as well? Jesus promises hope, and yet we find ourselves filled with anxiety and panic because I know he provides for my daily bread, but right now my bills are kind of tight. We find ourselves in many cases saying, I believe, but help my unbelief. Thomas here, he doesn't get to be privileged that first Easter Sunday to the resurrection. And I think this was on purpose. Like, God knew that he wasn't there when he showed up. I don't think Jesus showed up and was like, let me count. Oh, there's only 10 of you? Ah, that'll be close enough, right? He knew Thomas was missing. And I think that was on purpose. Because of what happens next. Eight days later, that is eight days after the resurrection, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Which right there, picture that, right? The doors were locked and Jesus shows up inside. Right off the bat, I would be terrified. Not only was this man dead, he's now dead inside my house. (laughs) Jesus shows up, peace be with you. That's what you need in our fears, in our doubts, in our confusions. 
We need God to speak peace. Peace be with you. And then he continues. He says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. I love the tenderness in Jesus. Thomas declares to the disciples, I want to believe, but I just can't unless I see it for myself, unless I touch it and feel it and know that it's real. I want to believe, but I can't. And Jesus doesn't show up and scold Thomas and say, Thomas, I told you, how come you didn't believe? He doesn't show up and say, I've risen from the dead. What else do you need of me? Right? Like, how much more can I prove that I'm being true by dying and rising again? Now, he doesn't show up to chastise or come with guilt or condemnation. He comes to Thomas in this place of doubt and disbelief and questions and confusion. He says, Thomas, here's the proof you need. Everything. Go ahead. Feel it. See it. Here it is. Believe. And then the story continues. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. See, we have a difficult task as Christians. It is weird to place our hope in a man who died 2,000 years ago, who claims to have risen from the dead. I've never seen him or touched his hands or his feet. Have you? It is weird to believe in a faith that started as an outcast, actually as a criminal cult. It is weird to believe in these things that Jewish people 2,000 years ago were desperately seeking. Our faith as Christians does not make sense, except because he's risen. See, there's nothing about Christianity that makes any value to any of us if Jesus is not risen. But if he is risen, indeed, there is great hope for us. If Thomas's doubt and confusion and questions can be answered by Jesus and met with kindness and care, here, see the proof you need. How much more so can our doubt and questions and confusion? Then John, he continues after this with a couple of lines. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Like, right there, just a little caveat. How rude, right? (laughs) He is risen from the dead, but he did other things that I'm not going to tell you about. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I love that. Jesus did so much more that we can't even begin to tell you about. But these things are written so that you can believe. See, for you and I, as we wrestle with this good news that Jesus is risen, and then we turn around tomorrow morning to go to work, and life is hard or ugly or miserable or maybe just boring, right? That's an okay place to be too. As we go about our day with this promise that he's risen and we're left with this, what's the point? It doesn't feel any different now. There's really good news for us. These things were written so that we may believe. And I believe wholeheartedly this story of Thomas's doubt and confusion was not left so we could shame Thomas, how come you didn't get it? But was purposefully included there by God so that you and I, when filled with doubt and confusion and questions, could say we're not alone. And not only are we not alone, 
God graciously comes to make himself known to us. No, most of us this side of his return will not get to see or feel his hands and his feet. In fact, I would say probably all of us this side of his return won't get to put our hand on his side and know for ourselves on our own account that he is risen. But he gave us these disciples. John, he writes this gospel near the end of his life. By the time John is writing, all the other disciples have been killed because of their faith that Jesus rose from the dead. And John's the last one alive. And he writes this account knowing that soon after, he will pass away. And there won't be any other witnesses who were there that day who saw Jesus interact with Thomas's doubt and confusion. John says, I need to write these things down that those who come after can believe on account of these things. So what does that mean for you and I as we go about our daily life? Well, first, it's really, really good and okay to have a lot of doubts and questions and confusion. If you don't understand everything about your faith, that probably means your faith is placed in a God who's bigger than you, and that's good. If there are things you look at in the natural world and you say, I just don't get how these two things line up, my faith and these, this evidence I see, it feels contrary, that's probably good because every natural evidence I've ever seen says people don't rise from the dead. And so it should feel contrary at times. For you and me, it's good to have questions because questions spark in us an opportunity to wonder. God, I wonder at these things I don't know. And I wonder at your promises I don't yet experience. And I wonder at your goodness when life is really hard. And that's good for all of us. And so here at The Point, we intentionally encourage questions. Like if you've been here more than like 10 minutes, you know we talk about questions a lot because I think questions are the way in which we discover more of God. Now, you and I can talk questions all day long, and yeah, I've got a theological degree so I can give some big words and some fancy what other people said. But the truth is, you can find all of those big words and fancy what other people said on Google. You, you don't need me for that part of your faith. But you know, I think questions back and forth, either anonymously here on Sunday mornings or over coffee or a drink or lunch, these questions back and forth are good for us because they drive us not to our own understanding, but to go back to his word. What does God reveal here? What have we seen here that can help us believe in spite of our unbelief? So this morning, I want to encourage you. If you have questions and things you just don't quite grasp, or doubts you're saying, God, I want to believe, but dive into Scripture. Make a habit of reading or listening to or meditating on or talking about His Word. All of this was written so that we can believe what He has done for us. And the truth is, there will be days when believing is really, really hard. Not because he's not a good father or a good God, but because we are broken and sinful and don't see things clearly. And when things are hard to believe, question everything. Part of what I uh, came to find questions to be a helpful part of life is there was a season in my own life when I was in college where I was really struggling saying, God, I, I, I believe, but I don't really want to. Like, this seems so absurd. I kind of want to just go about my life and have Sundays free and not have to go this direction. I want to do whatever I please. And while I was wrestling with a lot of questions specifically about injustice that I witnessed, I watched a movie which I do not endorse and I'm not recommending, a movie called Dogma, which if you've seen it, has nothing to do with the Christian faith. In fact, it's a mockery of the Christian faith in many ways. But through that process of this mockery of the faith, I personally came to say it's okay that I don't actually know all the things I think I know. 
And it's okay to not always be certain and to wrestle and to question. And for me, that weird movie led me to say, I want to pursue and question and explore. And about a decade later, God brought me here to a church where long before I got here, you guys said, questions are good, let's keep asking them. What questions are you wrestling with? Are you taking time to Google them or are you taking time to dive into God's word and search them out? Are you seeking people who know his word and saying, I don't get it, but I'll believe it because it says so. If you and I take all of our doubts and all of our confusion and all of our questions and we recenter it on God's word, I promise you will grow in faith and an understanding of a God who loves you more than we could ever tell you or ever show you. That's my hope and my prayer and the point of us as Christians to grow together in his word. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you for Thomas, one of your disciples who walked with you, who ate with you, who watched you raise people from the dead, and yet he himself did not fully believe until he could experience it firsthand. God, while many of us will never this side of your return experience firsthand the wounds in your hands and your feet and your side, I thank you that these things were written so that we may believe. Teach us today to believe. Teach us today to ask the hard questions, to wrestle with the uncertainties and to know that you graciously and kindly come to us to meet us where we're at through your word time and time again. God, we thank you for your kindness and your love. May we draw near to you each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.